Thanks so much. Um, so thank you again, everyone, for coming. Um, today's session is very timely for us uh, because you know uh, the conversation around climate change is one that has dominated uh, you know headlines over the past couple of months. If you are someone who reads the news religiously the way I do, you would have seen that either on New York Times or you know any of these big major um, news network. What you will see is either the recent winter freeze in Texas or all of the declarations that companies or countries are making. Um, but amidst you know, these declarations and this conversation, there's also the call for equity and fairness in how we approach climate change. And this is a topic that is central to our guest speakers' research and work. We are glad to welcome Rose Mutiso you know, back to Dartmouth. Rose is the research director for the Energy for Growth um, for the Energy for Growth Hub and the co-founder and CEO of the Mawazo Institute, which supports the next generation of female scholars and thought leaders in East Africa. Previously, Rose was a senior fellow in the Office of International Climate and Clean Energy at the US Department of Energy, where she led the department's engagement on technology and policy dimensions of energy access in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. Prior to this, she served as an Energy and Innovation Policy Fellow in the Office of U.S. Senator Christopher Coons, where she co-authored several pieces of legislation that were signed into law by President Barack Obama. She earned a BA and B in Engineering Sciences with a concentration in Material Science from Dartmouth College and a PhD in Material Science and Engineering from the University of Pennsylvania. Thank you so much, uh, Rose. Rose. Our moderator today is Elizabeth Wilson. She's a professor of environmental studies at Dartmouth and the inaugural director of the Evan Institute for Energy and Society. Now I'm going to hand it over to Elizabeth uh, to kick us off. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Thank you so much, Remy. And thanks also to the Tech Africa Club for organizing this event. The Irving Institute is thrilled to be able to co-sponsor with you as I know the Revers Center for Energy at Tech is also. So thank you very much for your leadership in starting this conversation with Rose. One of the best things about working at Dartmouth are alum, alumni like, like Rose. And to be able to be in conversation with her, to engage with Rose and her ideas is something that I think you'll also really enjoy today. And I hope some of you have had the opportunity to watch her very compelling TED Talks. Um, my class watched them yesterday and it was absolutely fantastic. They were very inspired and I'm, I'm looking forward to our conversation today. So we'll be speaking for the first 35 minutes and then we'll be opening it up for questions and answers. And um, feel free to type any questions you have into the chat. This meeting is being recorded. So if you have any other friends or any other people, we'll be able to watch it later too. So Karibu Rose, we're really so happy to you. have you here at, at Dartmouth. We're really happy to have you here as part of our conversation. Um, and one of the, the first questions, let's start with the theme of your recent TED talk, energy inequality. Um, how does energy inequality factor into the climate change discussion? Can you help us understand the implications of energy inequality in our world today? Um, all right, so this is a great question, a little bit of a big question that, um, you know, we can approach from so many different angles. So maybe I'll just start for, you know, maybe the benefit of the audience members who might not be as familiar with this topic, you know, what is even, um, what, what, what is energy um, inequality or what is energy poverty? Um, so many of you have probably had this, this uh, you know, classic statistic about a billion people worldwide uh, lack access to electricity. Um, I think we've made a little bit of progress. We're just shy of uh, 1 billion right now, but most of these people are actually in Sub-Saharan Africa. So I think about 600 million people in Sub-Saharan Africa don't have electricity. Um, as part of the SDG process, so um, for kind of people who are not very much in development speak, so the, the Millennial Development Goals were um, succeeded by the S Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs. And that was the first time that there was an explicit goal around energy. And so this goal, SDG 7, has goal targets around renewable energy, energy efficiency, and energy poverty. The energy poverty goal is the one that has really been focused on this 1 billion people thereabouts about electricity and has created a lot of momentum in the international community. I think rightfully, uh, this is, you know, over a century since, you know, the, the times of Edison. And it's a real shame that there are people who are, you know, pretty much stuck in 
the medieval era in terms of how they get their basic energy services at home. Um, so that's one piece of the pie and everyone is thinking, okay, um, a ton of people uh, in really poor countries are outside of the energy consumption space. That's a real injustice. Um, part of what I do with the Energy for Growth Hub is actually broadening the dis definition of energy poverty. So um, only 25% of our energy is used in the home. Um, in you know rich countries, a lot of our energy consumption is in industries, uh, in the services sector, in the commercial sector, in agriculture. You know, and so one thing that is really missing from this energy poverty conversation is not just that people don't have lights in their home, but their entire sectors that are literally in the dark. And so productive centers are not being powered, which is, you know. Um, an, an even bigger challenge or an even bigger problem. So there's this whole energy poverty conversation. And I think when it comes to climate change and how it ties in, the conventional kind of approach is everybody's kind of freaking out because they're like, okay, you know, will Africa be the next China? Okay, what will happen if, you know, the, you know, 1 billion people in Africa are like, you know, driving gas guzzling SUVs have, you know, big screen TVs. <laughs> And, you know, uh, you know, this kind of consuming like rich countries, what will happen? Uh, this will blow, blow, blow climate change out the water. And so how can we lock in um, clean energy before or, or how can we maybe uh, even maybe more prob problematically, we can't let poor people consume like rich people uh, to keep climate in check. And so I think that's often how you hear climate change connected to energy poverty. I, you know, myself and my colleagues at the Energy for Growth Hub try to complicate this message, but maybe I'll stop there. But, you know, I think that's kind of where the conversation is. Well, and I think this is what we're going to be unpacking over this hour. And, and, and your complication has been nuanced and it's been smart and it's been provocative and it's absolutely critical and important for all of us to hear going forward. So continuing with this theme of the TED Talk and your research, you've advocated for a new way to fight climate change in Africa. Can you explain what that new way is? Yeah, so it's, you know, um, one thing that kind of, it's a kind of a multi-point uh, approach. Unfortunately, I haven't figured out a way to distill it down to a bumper sticker, <laughs> working on it. The best things in life are often complicated. <laughs> Luckily, this is a very sophisticated audience, so I can kind of take many detours and be extremely nuanced. Um, so multi-pronged message. One message is that uh, kind of in Africa, where we're in Sub-Saharan Africa, especially perhaps taking sub uh, South, Af South, South Africa out, which is, you know, our biggest, big, uh, accounts for most of the emissions in Sub-Saharan Africa and is uh, a major coal uh, coal powered country, but you know, for the most part, Sub-Saharan Africa accounts for less than a percent of cumulative emissions in the world. And this is even if you include, you know, South Africa and stuff. And so, uh, you know, very minor player in the emissions game, very, very low baseline. And so mitigation, which is what, what most rich countries are thinking about is how do we bring down our emissions? How do we, yep. um, you know, uh, peak them and come down and achieve net zero. This is not the right way to think about Africa because there's no mitigation to be had. There's there's nothing there. And, and, and for economic growth, for economic justice, actually there needs to be an increase in energy consumption. That means probably in the short term, um, some net emissions coming from that region because we're starting from such a low baseline. But, you know, in general, in the short term, this will be a very minor uh, contributor to the global picture. You know, the problem when it comes to mitigation is in the major emitting countries, US, China, and Europe, and so so have you. So I think that's the first thing is that there's no mitigation play in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, maybe excepting South Africa for the most part. And two, um, because Sub-Saharan Africa is so vulnerable to climate change um, mm -hmm. and energy mm -hmm. is so central to adaptation. Just look at what's happening in Texas right now, you know, uh, to cope with extreme weather, to cope with droughts, energy, and especially electricity, because our world is becoming increasingly electric, is so central to that. And so um, Africans are on the receiving end of a lot of climate instability, and we need a lot of energy to contend with that. And so that adaptation is really the the discussion or like and, that. And the then needing to be linked so tightly together because it's yeah. not just energy for today's world, it's energy for the world we're moving into. Yeah. And 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 I think the 
you know, energy, there, there needs to be an energy transition globally. And mm -hmm. I agree by mid-century, we need to live in a completely different world, Africa included. But then in the transition, I think different approaches are needed for different regions. And my argument and that of my colleagues of the Energy for Growth Hub is that if there's any region that uh, deserves whatever is left of our carbon budget in the transition, it should be Africa. And then, you know, everybody else needs to double down and get the act together. Just from a basic equity perspective. And, and, and we're wondering, how does this fit within the recent climate change goals and the declaration for countries and companies now across the globe? Can you tell us where this puzzle piece fits? What would need to change to make it fit better? Give us your kind of trajectory and analysis here. Uh, yeah, so I think it, it fits in a number of ways. So one, from the perspective of most African countries, so, you know, for the record, there's almost no kind of official climate denialism among African countries. So mm -hmm. African countries have signed the Paris Agreement. It's kind of have most made of the ambitious, rest of the world, right? <laughs> have made ambitious NDC. So this is not a region that is mm -hmm. like trying to get away with not taking climate change seriously at all. And actually, you know, uh, definitely some, I look at the power sector, uh, Africa's power sector is one of the greenest in the world. Uh, in a lot of Africa where it's majority hydro in places like Kenya, geothermal, you know, massively green mm -hmm. uh, power systems. And so this is, and then on top of that really aggressive um, NDC commitments, a lot of uh, renewable resources, be it wind, solar, and really trying to move in that direction. So I think from an African country perspective, there's a real commitment to renewables and a green transition and, and you have it. Um, in the short term though, uh, Africa's ability to um, accommodate large proportions of renewables, variable renewables. And this is mm -hmm. especially uh, stark because the African power systems are like the, in, there's, there's not a lot of um, uh, capacity. And so even small, you know, I think Kenya added like, I don't know, 400 megawatts of wind and that was 15% of our grid, you know, it's like, <laughs> The scale is really different. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, the kind of uh, integration issues that we see in rich countries become even more important. That means mm -hmm. more than uh, most countries, African uh, governments need to contend with, uh, you know, um, baseload power, uh, managing a grid. Some countries like Kenya are really lucky. So Kenya has like very abundant geothermal. And so we mm -hmm. have are, you know, even even with hydro being really unreliable, we have a really good uh, clean source of vessel power. You go to Ghana, you go to Nigeria, that's just not the case. They're probably right. going to need natural gas to balance the grid in the short term. And so I think that's part of the message is how can we allow for a diversity of sources to as we try to achieve these green goals and as we try to kind of um, add sophistication to the grids in Africa. And this is the same problem that rich countries are facing. I think in terms of the commitments that uh, are coming out of the West, um, uh, you know, I think when industry leads as we're seeing now and is starting to take this seriously and there's a real um, uh, commitment by governments and others in investing in innovation, the downstream effects for Africa is that as we are transitioning, uh, uh, we reap the benefits of just um, a lot of innovation that makes okay. a green future possible. And, and, and this is really interesting to think about because I, I, I've lived in Kenya, I've also lived in Burundi, where you have 9% electrification, and compared to Burundi, Burundi, Kenya is so well set up. And so I appreciate those differences between different African countries when it comes to being addressed these issues. I'm curious about um, you, your, your, your idea that Africa should be prioritized for the remaining carbon budget. How do you envision that priority would unfold? Um, is this from policy? Is this part of global climate agreements? Is this investment based? Um, which levers do you see kind of leading us towards a pathway where we can make that prioritization a, a, as a planet? Yeah, great question. Obviously, there's no kind of top down centralized <laughs> approach like the UNFCCC can't say, okay, everyone, you have zero now and then Africa, you know, can allocate. Right, right. <laughs> In this, right. And this, the whole point of the NDC process is this voluntary kind of ground up approach, mm -hmm. which is the only kind mm -hmm. of politically feasible way to go about it. So, you know, a couple of ways that this idea of give Africa the balance of the 
uh, carbon budget plays out real uh, kind of um, practically is one, a lot of energy investments in Africa actually uh, driven by um, the DFI, so World Bank, uh, you name it, and 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 donor donor backing uh, from kind of Western rich countries. So there's and and you know other players like even China coming coming on board. Anyway, the point is. Um, the major emitters uh, play a very big role in mm -hmm. determining energy investments in Africa. What we're seeing increasingly is because um, a number of countries, and we see this especially in Europe, uh, which is those countries are much more, um, you know, um, aggressively uh, pursuing a, a pro-climate policy, which is great. But anyway, what we see is that um, there's a lot of anxiety to, you know, show progress in climate domestically that can be difficult. And so a really easy way to demonstrate um, action on climate is to have uh, your aid tied to really aggressive goals. And so one thing that we say is that uh, in some countries, some natural gas is important and will be required in the short term. And so blanket um, bans for like whenever, you know, we're not supporting any kind of non-renewable or, or even, um, uh, uh, priorities for aid that, that don't take into consideration the ecosystem. So you can't just say that, okay, the EU is only supporting like renewables in Africa, but then mm -hmm. what about infrastructure? What about the kind of ecosystem stuff like the grid, adding capacity and that kind of thing. And so part of what we try to advocate is how, how are rich countries, high emitting countries investing and what is what are the pressures they're kind of imposing on African countries through that. The other way is just you know, advocacy from an equity, just, you know, kind of trying to demonstrate to whatever ex extent this is helpful, the hypocrisy of uh, high emitting countries in this conversation. Yep. So, you know, as in your say, TED talk, <laughs> that was an amazing statement when you're talking yeah. about the development of natural gas for exactly. Europe, but then anytime an African country wants to build a natural gas plant, no, 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 can't do yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, so. that was so compelling. So it's important to be able to kind of just shed a light on that, that mm. you can say one thing and do another. And then um, I think in terms of, uh, you know, trying to, uh, in, in terms of innovation and even private sector investment in clean energy, it's just really um, spreading the message of how much that will have downstream impacts in terms of uh, the energy transition and the green transition in places like Africa. And we need more of that. And so trying to influence policy, even domestic policy in high emitting countries that all of those investments are part of kind of our global future. And, um, uh, both in public investments and private investments and, um, you know, really shining a light in kind of the, the causes common for all of us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that, that, that's a very powerful framing. And I think it's a really important one as well. Um, and then when you're squaring this discussion on prioritizing Africa with the carbon budget, when models are showing that um, fighting climate change on one side without corresponding effort from the other side complicates the entire movement, technology transfers and everything else. If the rest of the world moves one way and Africa the other way, is there an overall negative consequence to the world if African countries continue to fire up natural gas plants? So I think one thing that is important uh, to note, and I'll use a a framing that a good friend of the Energy for Growth, Growth Hub, uh, Professor Ken Caldera uses a lot yeah. of this idea of the transition. So um, <laughs> the world is moving in the same direction <laughs> right now. <laughs> you know, the world is still majority powered by coal. That is not gonna change overnight, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know? And so the transition period that I'm describing for Africa is also temporarily the same transition period for the rest of the world. It's just, really um, putting the onus on the high emitters to have to have an aggressively ambitious approach to that transition. And so there's not really, a, you know, the as far as it, based on the status quo, we're just moving more or less <laughs> in the same yeah. direction. So it's not, Africa is not moving in a different direction. We're all kind of in this, like nobody's doing what they should. And so temporarily everybody's in a transition. And so there's not really a divergence per se, it's just um, what is the, the rate of the scale, scale down? What is the, uh, uh, what, is, what are the speeds at which different, different countries are, are achieving that net zero um, really ambitiously and who's responsible for what? Um, ultimately, 
as I said, because Africa is for the foreseeable future in the short term is going to be a minor player. So, you know, a handful of natural gas plants in Africa, zero, yeah, <laughs> uh, and, zero, and zero impact <laughs> on, on the whole TED region. Talk, so why not? Yeah. yeah, go ahead. I was uh, saying in your TED talk, you talked if everyone in Africa increased their energy use, electricity use by three times, you'd still yeah. only be 1% of global emissions. Exactly. So we're, we're not moving in the opposite direction. We're not really yeah. causing the world to backslide in any, any way. Um, but, you know, we're all in a transition and Africa just has, because of the nature of our power system, because of our starting point, we have more. And because of justice concerns, we have a little bit more slack in terms of how temporarily we manage the transition. I, I think that's a, a really nice way to, to bring out some of these strands and highlight them um, in, and their impacts in different contexts. Um, the implications of climate mitigation strategies the world is pursuing, pursuing to Africa is the lack of investment to build these high carbon energy sources. So basically these incentives to not build carbon emitting um, um, power plants. Um, Larry Fink, CEO of BlackRock, wrote in his annual letter that his firm would avoid investments in companies that present high sustainability related risks. You're seeing that with a lot of banks, you're seeing that with a lot of uh, multilateral banks as well. How do you think about resolving these issues of lack of investment with the urgent need to prioritize Africa within the remaining carbon budget? So, you know, I, uh, I'm trying to think about the best way to, to uh, collect my thoughts on this. You know, if, if um, investment in the West and in, in rich countries and high emitting countries is moving in this kind of complete um, divestment mm -hmm. direction, which would be a massive move, that would have a lot of ripple effects worldwide. And so, you know, Africa is not the, um, the binding <laughs> constraint, constraint here. Right, right, right. <laughs> you know, if, if private investment in rich countries moves aggressively in this direction, it's going to completely remake yep. the entire energy system and ecosystem and, and kind of append incentives. And that will, you know, I think that that is a difficult transition to kind of uh, figure out. Uh, there, there, you know, there are obviously a lot of green assets that are becoming extremely attractive to even private uh, investment, but you know, major se segments of our global uh, economy still rely on fossil fuels, like in transport mm -hmm. and you name it. But anyway, so if if West, if you know, the Larry thinks of the world push push investment in that direction, then I. You know, I just, I think that um, a lot of innovations will come out of that or that the capital will help drive investments that make, I don't know, CCS possible or make completely green grids possible. And then Africa and the rest of the world benefits from that. And so, you know, um, uh, the, the signals, uh, you know, the signals won't, won't, won't be driven by Africa, it's just kind of whatever the, the rich high emitting world decides to do will have massive ramifications. Yeah, and that, that three times uh, energy use and 1% of global emissions just drives that home. I think the other statistic you gave was that Californians playing video games uses more energy than the entire country of Senegal. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> the the yeah. students' eyes just popped out when, when they when we got to that yeah. line. Yeah, and so everybody's always freaking out. I, I think it's, I mean, I think it's important. One, I don't want to underestimate the value of Africa entering this global conversation. Mm -hmm. We're global peers, and we need to be having peer-to-peer -peer conversations. So, for example, at the Energy for Growth Hub, my colleagues just wrote a piece connecting the Texas situation to Africa. So I love this kind of. Awesome common yep. cause approach to, you know, Africa is not in some ghetto where it's just like, oh, let's talk about, when we talk about African energy, we talk about a woman in a village. And, and then when we're talking about like, when it's like big boys talk, it's like, oh, let's talk about like grid Our and refinery sector and cement <laughs> yeah, yeah, decarbonization, you know I mean? right, right, right. <laughs> exactly, like, you know, the idea is like, uh, we all have, it's it's all in common. And so Africa, I don't wanna, say, I don't wanna create the impression that we're not stakeholders, we don't have a part to play. But, you know, the, you know, everybody's freaking out about uh, Africa and what we'll do and how we'll become polluting and what is our future trajectory. That is a kind of misdirection of, <laughs> of where the, the, the emphasis needs to be. 
No, I, I really, I really appreciate that perspective. And I think your comment on um, the loss of power in Texas and the changing climate is a really nice time for us to pivot then to the adaptation side of the story with the recognition that the continent is incredibly vulnerable to climate change. Um, the extreme weather, extreme drought, extreme heat, and also the storms that are kind of coming through and, um, uh, and, and affecting the continent. How should the continent balance the climate change vulnerabilities and development going forward? How can those adaptation needs be integrated into the development trajectory? So, um, you know, on the ground in many African countries, uh, policymakers, uh, you know, thinkers, a lot of people get it. And so there's, uh, I think more than most parts of the world, uh, this idea of climate, climate adaptation, climate yeah. uh, planning has been, uh, you know, somehow in part driven by donor interest, but this has been a big part of the, the policy conversation in Africa for mm -hmm. a long time, like mm -hmm. convers uh, phrases like climate smart agriculture. I you know, this has been a thing for a long time. And my dad back in goodness knows when was starting desertification which is kind of right, a pre right, prequel right. to all of this yep. uh, decades ago. And so this is something that is a conversation that um, vulnerability and changing weather and climate has been a conversation in, in Africa and has been part of planning uh, for a long time. I think part of the problem in Africa for many African countries is one, um, there's so many competing interests. Yeah. And so power and energy has been very much on the margins because sometimes it seems like a zero sum game. And especially even now with COVID, you know, it's like, should we invest in healthcare or just helping students get back into school and just basic education? And, and like, you know, uh, energy kind of has, has not fared really well. So what I think is changing, which has driven um, a lot of positive change is really understanding energy as enabling Mm -hmm. for all mm -hmm. of these other priorities um, and maybe helping African countries not see it as a zero sum that to have a functional health health system you need power right. uh, to have right. economic growth employment anywhere in the world you need power for a health <laughs> yeah system. exactly you know if you want if you, you know there's this youth population challenge there's uh, unemployment challenge there's no opportunity uh, every African country writes you know uh, paper uh, kind of high ambition uh, position papers about how they want to attract manufacturing from Southeast Asia, blah, blah, blah. If you don't have affordable, reliable electricity, cheap power, never gonna yeah. happen. Yeah. Um, and so I think African countries are starting to really see how um, energy is at the core. And, and I think any kind of energy first um, lens then has to incorporate climate because energy is also central to climate uh, adaptation. And at the same time, um, there's a lot of interest in building green, sustainable energy infrastructure that looks forward into the future. Well, I really appreciate the sustainable development goals. I mean, energy feeds into almost every other one. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it's not something you can take out and think of separately. It really is, an, as you said, an enabling force here. And so thinking about that in terms of adaptation, in your talk, you mentioned the need for um, pumps for irrigation. You mentioned the need for air conditioning to deal with extreme heat. Could you talk a little bit also about some of those adaptation measures um, that would be important for the continent going forward? Yeah, so definitely a kind of perennial issue that has just been um, uh, worsened in many African countries, especially in the Horn of Africa, Eastern Africa, where you know, right. uh, I'm from. Um, drought, water scarcity, um, very sm small percentage, e even, you know, uh, in the better times, a very small percentage of African agricultural land has been under irrigation. So agriculture, mm -hmm. agricultural productivity has always been so low. And now we're kind of having a lot of pressure. So, okay, we have rain fed ag agriculture, which is not efficient and is very vulnerable to climate. Uh, there's uh, depleting um, water tables. And so there's, there's that we will need, you know, pumped irrigation um, increasingly, probably desalination, all of these really energy intensive um, uh, approaches to get water into agricultural, industrial, residential sectors. Um, and then, you, you know, our infrastructure, you, we need uh, seawalls, we need more robust buildings uh, to be able to, you know, to deal with uh, typhoons and, you know, cyclones and all the stuff that we are seeing more and more of and heavy rains and flooding and stuff like that. And so we're starting from a kind of very low infrastructural background for um, uh, fitness uh, 
uh, in those areas. And so uh, that that is a massive investment. Energy is just one piece of what that investment will take, but a very important piece. No, um, I, it's, it's important to just underscore that, I think, three times, because it's really one of the pieces that the planet is facing moving forward. But in Africa, it means something that's even ch 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 yeah. more important there. Yeah, and, and then, uh, I, you know, so much of our workforce is, uh, depends on agriculture, and that is going to become less, uh, it's already quite, um, uh, uh, that's a, a really precarious position for many people to be in already, and that's going to become even more so. And so we need to employ and give opportunities to very many people and our very kind of bulging youth population. And so that is part of the climate adaptation. <laughs> conversation is where are all of these people going to go who how will they be housed how will they be paid work, live, where will they work yeah, um, because climate is adding pressure to in all of these directions and so yeah. um, you know we just need a really kind of functional um, uh, energy ecosystem that enables all of these other sectors no thank you so much for that we're going to go back up to the highest level um, as so many African countries were signatories to the Paris Climate Agreement, how does this prioritization, prioritization of, of thinking about the adaptation and development needs, thinking about the remaining carbon budget, square with their nationally determined contributions, their NDCs? What are your thoughts on how they should prioritize energy for growth and focusing on their adaptation and resilience capacity afterwards? So interestingly, um, most African countries are very much aligned, uh, as I said uh, yes. before, like many NDCs uh, uh, discuss adaptation concerns. This has been a big mm -hmm. part of the conversation, sometimes even tenuous conversation around um, how rich countries, <laughs> basically in the climate discussion, this has been an ongoing thread. Right, how rich countries right. need to help poor people, countries uh, adapt. This has been a big part of um, the strategy and the kind of position of African countries for a long time. Um, at the same time, a lot of African countries have, you know, ambitious renewable energy uh, goals, recognizing their resources as they reach rich in many renewable resources. Um, but, you know, I think what we're seeing more and more is, uh, you know, it used to be that African countries are kind of backed up in a corner and, you know, um, I've, I, I, you know, I've been to multiple uh, meetings where, you know, an African policymaker is just like, you know, leave us, you know, we just don't, don't, you don't dictate at us, you know what we, and it's almost this reactionary, you know what, we can get coal from China if we want. <laughs> so, uh, because it's just, uh, this, well, and you are, so yeah. I mean, and, and, uh, yeah. yeah. And so the idea is like, um, there's no doubt that there's ambition in NDCs among African countries and an acknowledgement of adaptation as important. I think what is really needed and what African countries are really asking for is flexibility, investment, support. I'm, I'm going to, after this last question, I'm going to open it up for um, questions. So feel free to type your question in the chat box. Either that, you can use the blue raise hand tool and we can take your question live. Um, but the last question to end our, our conversation, and thank you so much, Rose so generous to be to be here and share with us your perspective. What are the opportunities available for companies and for individuals to build smart energy policy programs, futures in Africa? Um, so this is, it's, it's almost, I don't, it, it's not even optional. <laughs> it's, not, it's not like a, a, something that, you know, the, the kind of super kind of with it, um, uh, you know, future business leaders on this call will kind of will be super ahead of the pack on this. You know, it's almost everybody's now on the bandwagon <laughs> because yeah, everybody yeah. has realized that the only business opportunities that make sense for the world are the ones that incorporate climate sustainability. Um, consumers are demanding this. Um, the, I, I, the increasingly policy will demand this and mm -hmm, the incentives mm -hmm. will be set from a regulatory perspective or policy perspective. And so I think this is this is this is the new normal in the world. We're still kind of crawling along and uh, we're still kind of um, uh, coexisting with contradictions yep. where you know like uh, <laughs> having our cake and eating it, but we're moving <laughs> in the right directions. And so I think 
um, just for this audience, both, uh, you know, the tax students who are going to work in the US or Europe or in Africa. Um, no, there's no area of business or of public or private life that will not touch uh, sustainability in one way or the other. And obviously they're the leading sectors, like, you know, right now, uh, storage is very hot. I bet Elon Musk would love to you know, grab some of the talent on this call. <laughs> mean um, hydrogens and the conversation yeah. queue, right? Yeah. And, you know, um, I, for example, I, I just wrote an op-ed with a, a good colleague of mine, Katie Hill, about data centers um, mm -hmm. and the nexus between climate energy uh, slash power and the internet. I think it's going to be a massive, massive area also. And so I think there are a ton of opportunities. What is really missing, and maybe this is for the African students on the call, um, just in my experience as somebody who was in the US for a while and you know, went back home is um, kind of homegrown ideas just have no room to, to, to there's no investment, there's no support, there are no connections, there are no networks. Um, there are a lot of kind of smart people on the continent uh, with great ideas, but it's it's so hard to kind of achieve that kind of escape velocity in all the dimensions needed. And so mm. uh, for the African students on the skull or kind of people with interest in Africa, there's a real opportunity to be a bridge because you have networks, knowledge, know-how <laughs> that span these different contexts. And I think that this is something that can really make that kind of what are the opportunities from a kind of Africa led perspective become more of a reality. No, that that's absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much, Rose, for our conversation. I have a question in from Andrew Alley, who is the PhD student at Thayer and um, actually spoke at uh, the class we were talking about you yesterday. So mm -hmm. it's a nice circle here. Um, he writes, I've read the Energy for Growth Hub's paper on the modern energy minimum of 1,000 kilowatts per person per year. That's roughly what a U.S. household will use in a month. So uh, this is a really useful framing because it acknowledges that energy needs to be consumed, not just made available to boost human development. How are you and others on your team thinking about supporting the transition of this energy to end uses, particularly in agriculture? Well, um, hi, Andrew. I'm so I'm so touched that you've read the <laughs> this kind of wonky paper. You have here. a big fan club here, Rose. Right? It goes like much um, I'll farther have to tell than you my colleagues, uh, uh, Todd and Katie, and others who worked on it. Um, uh, also, thank you so much for that. And also, I as a kind of former Thayer student. Um, big greetings um, to you. So I love what you said, um, Elizabeth, about kind of the average consumption in a US household in a month. So just adding further texture to that, um, the average per capita consumption of electricity in most African countries is less than 200 kilowatt hours, so less than 200 units. That's less than a typical American fridge. So this is like we in the, the gap in a month. What was the time unit there? Uh, a year. A year, 200 kilowatt hours a year per capita. Yeah, that is less than it's a refrigerator. Like, I mean, it's just like the, the gap is ridiculous. Right. Um, right. So, so we're working with such a, uh, uh, so per capita per person per year. So we're working with like a ridiculous baseline. And part the reason for this modern energy minimum is because the, the global ambition right now is set kind of, um, both by the the, uh, the people, the, the UN and affiliated uh, organizations leading SDG 7 plus the IEA that tracks progress. SDG, is, SDG 7 SDG is the energy goal. It's the energy yeah. goal, just for the yeah, people the, the that energy don't have them, part of you know, it. written on their arms like I, know. I do. Uh, the energy part of it. Uh, so I think like the ambition is basically about um, 100 or so. So basically right now the imagination is really capped at how can we get basic energy services in every household in Africa. So about a light bulb and maybe phone charging. Yeah, And so for us, this is what everyone is kind of trying to get at. Um, and it's an important goal. We need everybody to get on the modern energy ladder at, at a minimum. But then, you know, for us, the modern energy minimum is just trying to raise that ambition from this kind of the conversation being at the level of light bulbs and charging to, okay, fine. There's no, uh, basically about a thousand units per person per year is about where middle income countries kind mm -hmm. of start. And so it's, this is what, it, you know, it's a, it's a kind of a, a rough estimate, but this is where we believe, you know, where GNI and the power consumption correlate, yeah. this is a good target. Um, the other thing that's important um, is 
this target tries to break out what is consumption in the home versus consumption um, outside of the home. And these are the end users that uh, Andrew, you are alluding to, because uh, right now, a lot of the metrics just focus on consumption in the home, which as I said, is only about 25% right. percent, uh, of consumption in a typical energy sector. And so for us, we've just kind of said the modern energy minimum is just, um, it's, you know, um, it, it's a, a rough metric. It's, it's just a way to set um, uh, a North Star for people to think about, uh, to raise the ambition um, in terms of, and, and be, the idea being, if we get to power sectors that are at that level of consumption, many things will have happened in those kind of yeah. economies. Uh, there'll be a lot of positive um, movement uh, that would culminate in that kind of level of consumption. Um, in terms of end users, I think a lot of development partners are starting to really shift from this residential only. Um, lens and are starting to think about productive users. How can uh, how can we support work that is not just about uh, light bulbs in schools, but supporting agro-processing and other, um, other uh, initiatives where power can really add value in a lot of rural and, uh, rural and community enterprises. And I think that's all great. I think part of um, our challenge to the community uh, that, the, you know, as speaking for the Energy for Growth Hub is, it's this, this kind of imagination is, is, is still constrained by this development approach, which is, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. you know, it's just like rural, small scale, mm -hmm. women's groups, all important, but actually the end, end users that generate economic opportunity are a much larger scale. And this needs to be part of the part of the project. And so all of the stuff that's going on is like, how can we have like small micro pumps for small farmers? Um, how can we get like, women electrified sewing machines. I mean, that's that's all obviously good and important, but that is not going to get us to the 1000 energy, min, min, energy minimum. There's such a scale. There's a real problem with scale in this sector and in how we talk about it. No, that's that's really interesting. Um, we have a nice question from Mohammed Hassan. Thanks, Mohammed. Are there any innovations slash market solutions happening in water on the continent? He's um, thinking in, turn, in the context of droughts, farmers, et cetera. And I guess that intersection with energy is something you can directly address. Yeah, so there are a lot of, we see this, there's a lot of kind of piloting and um, uh, small scale innova innovations. I, I think maybe accepting North Africa, which I don't know a lot about, but I've heard that I think there's, uh, there's um, in Northern Africa, uh, uh, there, uh, you know, I'm sure I've, I've heard that part of even their aggressive solar scale is kind of solar tide desalination is a lot more um, progress has been made in those countries in terms of energy water nexus issues. So in Sub-Saharan Africa, where I work, there's a real acknowledgement that these two are tied. In terms of the local approaches and innovations, um, the conversation I see is still very much at the level of pilots, small, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. you know, ideation, innovations, um, and, and there's a, and, you know, it, it's, it's great that that activity exists, but it, it's really tough to tell which of those would take or would grow and scale and what would take to, to scale them as opposed to the kind of investments that we see in more mature countries and an example being say like Israel, which has kind of, you know, taken energy, uh, what an excess to the next level and right. uh, kind of such a scale of investments, uh, such sophistication. I don't know when and how that will kind of manifest in the sub-Saharan African context, but it's definitely something that people think about and policy discussions are had about energy, what an excess issues. And the investment story is the subject of one of our next questions. Um, Superior. Uh, uh, Actually, sorry, uh, Elizabeth, one, one yep. quick thing though. Um, yep. One big uh, power sector uh, water nexus issue that is very front and center in African, sub Saharan African countries is hydro. So right. Massive right. hydro base in our power systems, and hydro is increasingly vulnerable. And so, definitely, for example, in Kenya, there's been a really aggressive effort to transition from hydro to geothermal, and that has actually had made a world of difference for our reliability of our power system. So anyway, that's, I think, one area that uh, African countries are trying to get a handle on is how to deal with over-reliance on hydro and what happens next. And in hydro in the context of drought is so hard when there's yeah. no water to fill your dam and exactly. then you don't have the ability and, for power and hydro all has, over the world. And large hydro obviously also has a lot of kind of complications that I won't go into now, but in any case, the interconnections are there. People are trying to think about it from a power sector perspective. Front and center has been hydro, and then also um, irrigation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, a lot of African countries for a long time have been wanting to kind of replicate the green 
in this green revolution. <laughs> Many decades behind India, but still, uh, this has always been um, kind of top of mind. But then at the same time, there's this ecosystem of innovations and ideas um, to get at um, solving water problems. And these are just not scaling just yet. So given the need and the scale, there's clearly a capital need. Um, and uh, Ms. Sahara asks, how do you recommend large funds slash investors in the developed world should think about impact investing in the energy sector in Africa? Oh, yeah, this is always, uh, I guess I'm speaking to a very business savvy audience. So I'll, <laughs> I'll try and stick, stick to my lane here, which is much more engineering. So, okay, maybe uh, offline, Andrew and I can talk <laughs> in more detail about engineering things. Um, yeah, so, you know, sometimes um, it's helpful to apply a broad lens to issues of investment and barriers to investment. Um, first in Africa, but then also in kind of impact investing in general. So mm -hmm. I, you know, I spent a little bit of time um, working with and thinking about impact investing just even in the US. And this is an area that has matured a lot, but it's still, it's still, um, it's still a, 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 in relative infancy, even in places like the US and, and funds are, there's some uh, assets that are getting increasingly uh, attractive, uh, solar, wind, utility scale, stuff like that, you know, but it's still, the, 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 I'm just trying to put into context that impact investing is not just a thing that is challenging in the African mm -hmm. context. I think mm -hmm. it's just an area that um, a lot of work is still um, ongoing and including how do you define impact? How do you measure? Like there, <laughs> you know, and so like in that sector, they are the kind of in, uh, kind of in impact slash energy there, there, there are lower hanging fruit investments and assets and we're seeing capital crowding in. So that's kind of one part of the context mm -hmm, building. Mm -hmm. Another part of the context building is that just um, investing in energy in Africa and especially in green energy is, is in, in, in sub-Saharan Africa is not just uh, a sectoral issue. There's just like a, a big challenge of investment, private investment writ large and all of the ecosystem factors that make, um, you know, South Africa and North Africa account for so much of private investment on the continent. It just means that the countries in between have some ecosystem factors. And so crowding in capital for impact sectors, including green energy or just energy in general, will, uh, uh, and energy kind of taking out the obvious like oil and gas uh, assets that uh, the West right. has been playing in for a long time. It, they're, they're just broader ecosystem um, issues. And so right now, a lot of the impact investment we see is driven by smaller impact in energy in Sub-Saharan Africa, driven by smaller impact funds and donor driven funds and mm -hmm. donor backed funds. And mm -hmm. these are the ones that are supporting the off-grid solar uh, companies and the kind of smaller scale uh, type investments. There are some um, large, larger assets that are seeing private investments. So in Kenya, you know, some of our kind of um, geothermal generation mm -hmm. has attracted foreign funding, some of our large uh, utility scale wind and solar. And I think that will continue to grow, but it's just, I think um, private investment, even in the impact sector is always looking for the lower hanging fruit kind of less risky stuff. No, I, I, I appreciate that conversation. And it's one, I just wanna highlight that you will be speaking in our Investing in the Energy Futures Conference, the third and fourth of May that will be happening and, and involving a bigger, broader conversation on this topic. So thank you in advance for your participation there. For all Tuck people, you're also all invited as well. I see a couple students from my class. Hey guys, good to see you here. Um, and um, one of the things that came up in the, the talk yesterday where there were lots of talks about energy and in almost all of the pictures, it was men. And one of the questions from Anna Douglas is, I'm familiar with some organizations like Yielding Accomplished African Women that strive to get young people into tech. Are you aware of similar organizations to motivate young people in the energy sustainability space? I feel like the intersection would be a great opportunity. Um, definitely, uh, yes, this is uh, energy sector because uh, kind of, overlap so much with engineering and investment, then it's just kind of, you know, a massive, um, um, what is the best, a lot of bros, let's just say it that way. <laughs> so I think this is, uh, you know, 
and obviously because it's such a broad space, there's so many ways that we can plug women in, including in financial sectors, which I, I'm sure many of you will go into just uh, representationally, it's unfortunate that energy kind of links with these sectors that traditionally just don't have good representation, uh, yeah. law, <laughs> so it's a lot of legal issues, um, mm -hmm. um, uh, engineering, law, finance, like you name it, uh, decision-making policy. And so they're just generally the, uh, these are, there, there's massive uh, domination, uh, oh, sorry, maybe that's the word, uh, the, a lot of men <laughs> work in the sectors. Uh, so in the US, I know uh, quite a number of organizations, uh, women in energy type organizations, uh, um, uh, that we're, either... we're a charter member of NUI, New England Women in Energy and Environment here at Dartmouth. So yeah, April Salas and, and I made sure that we were part of that too. And I think more of that is needed and mm -hmm. uh, companies are trying to be more aggressive also in their recruiting um, and just uh, programs like, uh, I know Thayer has a really, um, you know, a really um, successfully, actually quite su successful uh, strategy around uh, graduating more female engineers. So all of this stuff is happening and is helpful. And I think if there are any women on this uh, call who would like to learn more about uh, kind of organizations, initiatives that support women and energy, let me know. I know a lot of friends and contacts who work in such spaces and even just Googling this. There's so much out there that's really, really promising. Um, in developing countries, including in Africa, where I, I I, I work uh, in East Africa more specifically, there's more, there's, there, there is activity in that space, but there are a couple of challenges. One is just pipeline, you know, so for example, my organization, we support women getting PhDs uh, locally. I'm always trying to get, uh, get us to support more women in the energy sector, mm -hmm. but just at the PhD level, there's just not enough pipeline, you know, mm -hmm. and so a lot more needs to happen to generate the pipeline to bring people along um, uh, further up. I know the utility in Kenya has internship programs for women, like people are really, really trying, but I think the development community still needs to expand its imagination. And so when development people are obviously very excited about women uh, in uh, in general <laughs> and, 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 you know, it's just, that's the kind of the, we love women, right. yes, gender, let's do it all the time. <laughs> But then what, what often happens is like um, when people think of energy and women, again, it's really the imagination is kind of limited to, okay, like where's the woman in the village, how you, which is an Im important bit, but it's not the whole story. And so I think development and some kind of impact sectors still, uh, you know, really don't have an attention to women more on the professional side of it and mm -hmm. the workforce side. And that really, really needs mm -hmm. to change. Um, I'm going to combine two questions and this will be the last ones that we have. And then I wanted to give you a few minutes just to wrap up your big thoughts that you want to leave in our heads as you leave. Um, and these two questions go back to the, the rural. Um, um, uh, Ms. Guara is asking about what is your opinion about what can be done to address the issue of um, people with no energy access who live in rural areas, but their willingness and ability to pay for energy technologies is low, even for the small scale systems such as cook, cook stoves or lanterns. How do you think about addressing this issue besides receiving aid or the subsidy for system? How does affordability change with large scale projects, especially for rural communities? And the question I'm combining it with is one from um, from uh, Richard uh, Dranger, who was asking about how the African grown ideas and wondering if African grown ideas, um, wouldn't mechanisms for doing so be more likely to invite ideas that would be more appropriate in the scale and priority of African needs at the household and or small business level? So, um, you know, not to punt the larger issues, he says, but just to recognize that there's lots of small whole issues. So we'll put those two together as a way to address the micro needs and the kind of normal, con normal framing of this topic and let you address that. And then we'll leave the last few minutes for you to leave us with your big thoughts. So we are uh, inspired yeah, so, as we leave. <laughs> okay, I think this has been a great conversation. Um, one, regarding rural communities, uh, super important. I think the, the, the social imperative is so high. Um, what we've proposed, my colleagues and I at the Energy for Growth Hub, is there needs to be some kind of division of labor, right? And so I think what we see happening is a lot of people trying to create a, you know, there's not always a business model 
you know, the, the willingness and ability to pay is not always there. There are a lot of competing um, uh, needs in poor rural households. Uh, and then also from the kind of the mainstream grid side, it's, mm -hmm. it's not always cost effective to pull the grid to rural communities. And so these small scale um, approaches like off-grid solar, mini grids could be a really powerful way to reach poor people in rural areas. And so that's the kind of the div division of labor that like maybe the main utility grid, because it's it's very loss making. And we're seeing this in uh, in countries like Kenya where there's, uh, they have the, the utility is given this mandate around rural electrification. It's not cost effective. Those customers are not paying and it's kind of, um, it's not where the utility needs to be right now. And so I think I really welcome the use of these kind of bridge technologies uh, mm -hmm. to reach those communities and uh, frankly subsidy like the government needs to step in where there's just for lifeline support for these communities that really, you know, many households can barely afford just like the really basic uh, lighting. Obviously subsidy is complicated. School if fees you will. in Kenya, yeah. school fees. Yeah, exactly. There needs to be a lot of design, but I think right now, like in Kenya, what happens is that rate payers subsidize, cross subsidize for the really poor people. And then that's driving industry off the grid because it's making the tariff higher and higher. And so the government really should be cross subsidizing in some, some fashion there, but you don't wanna go too far. Uh, some countries uh, over subsidize and kind of wreck the whole system. It has to be carefully designed. So I think that is my answer to the rural. There needs to be a division of labor and there needs to be government support. And then um, one minute for your big thought. <laughs> okay, maybe I didn't get the big one. Um, I would just say uh, my, my big thing that I like, one minute, okay. Ecosystem matters. Uh, I think there was a question here from someone about ESCOM and this is yeah. a classic example of what happens when utility mismanagement uh, corruption, um, you know, complete ecosystem failure. And so sometimes in energy, we're tempted to think about technology or investment, and that's our focus, but the connective tissue is so important. Mm -hmm. Like how, how are these uh, markets uh, set up? Uh, what are the reforms that are needed? I, this is, I mean, the same in Texas. This is what we're seeing, like this, the regulation, <laughs> compliance, incentives, capacity, right. all of yeah. this. And so it's, it's, it's really a complex problem and we need to be able to see the, the full picture. Well, I really want to thank you from just a great conversation. And I'd also like to really thank the uh, Tuck Africa Club. You guys rock. And, and anytime you want to do stuff on energy in the future, please reach out. Let's do stuff. Um, and Rose, thank you so much today. Remy, thank you so much today for just a really wonderful conversation and opportunity to engage on this really important topic. And Rose, we are lucky enough to see you in class tomorrow. Okay. Thanks, so. guys. All right. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Right. Bye. 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 Thank you. I think you need to stop the recording, Remy.